Now, Dave, Dave isn't here today because his uncle passed away last week, so uh, he and Melinda went to Iowa for the funeral. So um, he texted me and asked me if I wanted to get up here, and I said, are you kidding me? <clears throat> no, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you're here. Um, I, I just wanted you to know that the, now maybe the time before last when I was up here, I talked about how much I hated Mondays. And I talked about abundant life, about what Jesus came to give us abundant life as well as eternal life. And why, is, why am I as a Christian complaining about Mondays or Tuesdays or any day? And so I, am, I hope that I, I'd ask you to pray for me that I listen to me today, that I'm paying attention to what I say so that I walk away here with another message that will help me for the coming year. Because that's what this is all about. I have a pop quiz, first of all. Are you ready? Did you study? Oh, well, I'm disappointed. What would you say, now go back to when you're younger, okay? If you can remember that far. For me, that's hard, you know, since I was born in the Stone Age. Um, remember back when you were young, what was the best day of the year for you? What? I heard birthday. Birthday's great, especially mine. Uh, Christmas. That, you guys are better than the first service because they, 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 they said all different kinds of things, and I had to say Christmas. Because you think about it, when you were young, Christmas was this special, special, special time. And I, not always for the right reasons, because <laughs> mostly it was, how many presents am I going to get, and how big are they? That's what I looked forward to. Couldn't wait. But, you know, there, there were other things. My mom baked a lot of stuff. She had cookies going all the time, and the house smelled wonderful, and it was all decorated up. And, you know, and, and as a family, we would get in the car, and I'm sure it was something that my dad really loved to do, put us all in the car. But we went out around the little town I lived in and saw the Christmas lights. And that, I really looked forward to that. And so it was all this anticipation. It's not like it is now when you walk into Walmart in the middle of October and they're playing Christmas songs. Uh, come on. I mean, I, I love Christmas songs just as much as anybody else, but not in the middle of October. Come on. You know, it's not even Halloween yet. Even, yeah. So anyway, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox. But Christmas is such a, it's, it's anticipated. And, and that's why I love, you know, looking at young people. Because they are, they're so glad, they're so joyful. And then, here's the next thing. Here's the next question. What's the saddest day of the year? Wow, you have no sad days. Well, thank you, good night. <laughs> now, it, to me, the saddest day when I was younger is the day after Christmas. Because there was all this excitement, all this anticipation. Charlie Brown was on, the Grinch was on, all these other things I always looked forward to. And you only got to see them once a year. And, you know, you come downstairs on Christmas morning and there was a time where my sister and I met under the tree at midnight. Is that a little early to get up on Christmas? But we usually got up at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, which my parents just loved greatly. And when I get, had children, yeah, I could see why they were so upset. <laughs> Go back to sleep. Well, you couldn't sleep because it was Christmas morning. And you, and you come out into the living room or wherever you had your Christmas tree, and there was all these presents underneath the tree, and the stockings were filled, and... And, you know, we just knew, and all the cookies and milk that we left for Santa Claus were gone. And all this stuff, and it was so exciting. And then there's this flurry of wrapping paper going everywhere because before we did that, my sisters and I counted the presents to make sure that my name was on as many presents as her name was on. Because otherwise, my parents didn't love me. If I didn't get as many presents as my sisters, I mean, that's not fair. So then all this stuff is done, and my mom starts to take down the tree. And I remember where the little town I grew up with 
in was um, there was a, a station, TV station out of Quincy, Illinois. And it was CBS, and they used to run this promo before Christmas, and it had this reindeer that would come out, and he, you know, it was a big buck, and he had all these antlers, and he would shake his antlers, and the Christmas lights would come on. And I always thought that was so cool. The problem was, they kept showing that promo five days after Christmas. And I thought, how sad is this? Christmas is over. And just like Lauren, he said, yeah, but there's some people who are glad that Christmas is done. And I asked the first service if they would tell me, and it was all guys that said Christmas is, some of it was the women. And I thought, why are the guys raising their hand? They didn't do anything, right? Guys? But it, it got very sad. And, and, I, and you know, and, and now that I'm older, after Christmas is over, and the, you know, the holiday and the break and all this other stuff, and what do we have to look forward to here in Illinois? Snow, ice, cold, dreary days, and eventually it will, you know, it'll, it'll be spring. But it seems so far off. And we get, this is the time of year when people get most depressed. The suicide rate skyrockets during the holidays. And it's because people don't see a point. They don't see a reason to live. Even if they make resolutions, and how many, how many of you still make New Year's resolutions? You guys are silly. Forget it. Stop it. How many of you break them five minutes later? So my resolution this year is I'm not making any resolutions. It's, it's a waste of time. But it, it is. It's, people get depressed. And, and they, some people, because they don't like to use the word depression, use the word the blues. And I'm not talking about that great hockey team in St. Louis who won the Stanley Cup. Yay! Sorry got myself for a minute, but I'm talking about that feeling. I, I love the blues as music. I love it. It's one of my favorite musics, and people say, well, you, you only play the blues when you're sad. No, that's not true. If you really know about the blues, it's more about being strong and looking forward and not letting people get you down, so I thought, okay, what am I going to title this sermon, and, I, and Dave texted me on Monday afternoon, and said, you want to preach this Sunday? I went, ah! <laughs> Literally, I went that. Because I am nervous as I'll get out up here, folks. I, I, that's why I do this a lot. And I, I miss my pulpit that I could stand behind so you couldn't see my knees knocking. But I, I, I thought about maybe offering my services to Nick's band because, you know, instead of a, a wood block, you just use my knees. I could do that. So I, I thought about this. What am I going to talk about? Because I asked Dave, I said, is there something you want me to preach on? And he, he says, well, no, just you know, do what you want. Exactly. That's what, I, that's what I mean. And by the way, folks, you know, I know as parents, we get upset when our babies make noise. No, 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 no. I've told every young parent that brought a baby in, and whether they're crying or they're laughing or they're saying, dad, 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 I don't care. That's life. That's life, and that's great, and I love it. So I, that's fine. And I thought, well, what do people feel? Because that's why I ask you about what the saddest day is of the year. And, and, and it does. It, it, people get depressed, and, it, and I don't, and I'm one of them. I'm one of those people that, that's dealt with depression. And I get the blues, and you don't know why you get the blues, and you don't know how to get out of getting the blues. And so you do. You try to, to make a resolution. Well, like I said, five minutes later, we break those resolutions. But I've got the answer. I do. Well, not I. I don't have the answer. God has the answer. And so I'm going to read you a passage to you that the Apostle Paul, who is one of my heroes in the Bible, that he sent to a church that he loved dearly. And he knew that they needed encouragement because they weren't very big. And, of course, you know, back in those days, churches were being prosecu per prosecuted, persecuted. <clears throat> got my, I got my tongue over my eye teeth, and I can't see what I'm saying. Persecuted. And so they needed encouragement. And Paul was, he was, he was a great encourager. And so he wrote this to a church that he loved, the people he cared about a lot. And so that's why I want to talk to you about this today, because I care about you a lot. 
I love you. I don't care if I've known you for 40 years or for 40 seconds. I still love you. And so does God. So I want to give you what, I, what God, I believe, tells us is the cure for the blues. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Paul says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Now I want you to remember that word always. That's important. I will say it again, rejoice. Paul, Paul made a point that if he had something he really wanted to drive home, he repeated it. So obviously he really wanted people to rejoice. And so he said it twice. He goes on, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I want, I want you to remember, okay, I said forget resolutions. Forget what I just said. I'm going to give you five resolutions. Five, that's five, right? Five. I had a problem with math in school. Five resolutions that I want you to make in order to stave off the blues, in order to stave off the down times. Because I'm telling you what, folks, none of us here is guaranteed tomorrow. Happy New Year, right? Happy New Year. But we have. We, you can look around and we've, we know there, there are people that we lost this year that we love. And the reality of it is, because life is what it is, we're going to lose some more next year. That's the way it is. Now, it's not to depress you. It's not to make you sad. It's just that life is real. And life comes at you from different directions. And it's not always with a handshake and a hug. Life can come at you like a storm that's relentless. And it hits you with a lost job, a lost loved one, a lost relationship, financial frustrations, all kinds of stuff. And maybe it's just because the weather is bad. Or it's because your sad Christmas is over. But life is real, and it doesn't care who you are. It doesn't care how education, educated you are, how rich you are, how good-looking you are, how whatever you are, life is real. And we have to live it, because the only other choice you have is to get out of life, and no one wants you to do that. That's not the answer. The choice that we can make is to make these resolutions and stick to them. Because I guarantee you, if I'm still around... December the 31st, 2020, I'm going to come and ask you. I'm going to give you another pop quiz. Did you keep those resolutions I talked about back in December of last year? Here's the first one. Paul says in verses 4 and 5 to rejoice always in the Lord. That's what he said, in the Lord. Why in the Lord? Because you know what? Without the Lord, none of us would be here, and, and all of us would have a, a future that is very, very, very bleak. Because what the Lord gives us that Santa Claus can't, that our parents can't, that our friends can't, what the Lord has given us is grace. And if you don't understand what grace is, think about this. I rob a bank. <laughs> oh, I'm going to give the money to charity, Marilyn. It's all right. I'm gonna... No, I rob a bank. I'm guilty. They caught me on the video. They, they caught me with the gun in my hand. They caught, they caught me taking the money and walking out and going, ah, I'm rich now. They saw my face because I'm dumb enough to take the mask off my face and look straight at the camera. I go before the judge. The jury says, you're guilty. You're going to go away for a long, long time. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here comes Lauren. And he goes up and he shoves me out of the way and he says, no, send me to jail instead. Take me. Bob doesn't deserve it. He's much too pretty to be in jail. I don't say that. Well, I thought you said it. But, as, but th that makes no sense, right? Why would Lauren do that? He didn't rob the bank. I did. But he stands there and he goes, no, 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 take me instead. So that's what grace is. That's what Jesus did when he died on the cross. The Bible says that no one, no one is without sin. All of us have screwed up at one time or another and disobeyed God. If you say you have it, you're a liar. And so God gave us the grace that we didn't deserve. 
He gave us a free pass, a get out of jail free. And that's the first resolution that you decide this year in 2020 to live by grace. Remember who you are and remember who you belong to and remember what that person did for you that he didn't have to do. It makes no sense for us to forgive somebody who's hurt us, who hurt us badly. It makes no sense. Human beings say, why would you do that? Well, we're not God, and thankfully we're not, because God loved us enough that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish. Think about that. That's a powerful statement. And, and I know there are people who will sit out there, and I, you know, I'm the same thing. Think about all the things, the bad things that I did. And we live every day in regret. And regret, I'm guaranteeing you, will lead to depression. Because you're always living in the past. It's always what I did. Always back there. You're not thinking about today. But if we live by grace, we understand who we are and what price it cost God to buy us out of that hell. And if we remember that, if we live each day that way, not just on Christmas and not just on Easter and not just on special days, whatever it is, but every day, even Mondays. So the first resolution is resolve to live by grace in the Lord. The second one, he says in verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. How many of you worry? Anybody that didn't raise your hand, you know, back about being without sin, you're just as big a liar. Come on. Everybody worries about something. Sometime in your life, whether you're a teenager or an adult or whatever it is, somewhere in there you got worried about something. And I know that for sure because I come from a long line of warriors. My mother was the champion warrior. If there was a gold medal in the Olympics for worrying, my mom would have won every year she entered. She just knew that if I was five seconds late coming in the door when I said I was, I was dead. She just knew it. And she, if she didn't have anything really to worry about, she made something up. I think it was her hobby. But worry is deadly. And it is, physically and spiritually. You know, if you worry, you know, worry can harm your body. If all you're doing is thinking about things that you cannot control, and yet that's what worry, that's what worry is. It's wanting to control things that you can't. It's wanting to get your hands around circumstances and make them behave the way you want them to behave. But we can't do that. We're not capable. We don't have that ability. We have ability to do a lot of things. But controlling situations and circumstances, we don't have. So what do we do? We worry. What if? You know, that may be the two worst words in the English language sometimes. What if? What if I had done this? What if I do that? What if I don't do that? What if? And that's what we spend our time doing, wondering what if, instead of doing what we can do. And what Paul says we can do is replace that worry with prayer. You know, some people say, well, prayer is the last resort. If I can't work my way out of this situation, I'll pray. <laughs> no. It should be the first resort. The first thing that you do when you feel that anxiety, that worry creeping into your, your mind is to get down on your knees if you can or at least pray to God. That's where it is because we may not be able to change circumstances, but what God can do is within those circumstances, he can bless us, he can bring us up, he can show us that there's a way out, he can show us that there's hope, that we're not hopeless, that we're not worthless, that we're not useless. There is a reason for you to be here. The world may tell you the opposite. The world may tell you that you have no worth. Nobody cares about you. God doesn't care about you. If God cared about you, why are you in these circumstances? Why do you have cancer? Why did your relationship break up? Why did your 
your family member die. Why, why, why? That's what he gets you to ask. Because if he, God loved you, those things wouldn't have happened. <laughs> Remember what I said about life? Yeah. Storms are going to come in everybody's life. Everybody's. And it's what we do when those storms come that's important. Now we can worry, and we can give up, and we can give in, and we can decide to hide, but that's not going to solve the problem. That's like putting a Band-Aid on a broken leg. It's not going to do any good. So what Paul encourages us to do is to pray. Talk to the, go to the one who can listen, who will listen. You, trust me, people, there, you have people, I think, in your life who actually tune you out, X you out, ignore you, make, sure, make pretend that you're not there. You know what my biggest pet peeve is, besides the people cutting me off in traffic? I get to pick on people because I'm up here and you're not. <laughs> There's nobody sitting in the front row but Lauren, but I've already picked on him. So let's say I'm having a conversation with Eric, and we're talking about the Blues, and we're talking about the Cardinals, and we're talking about all the important stuff in life. And all of a sudden, Courtney says something. And Eric goes, squirrel. Now, I'm not saying Courtney's a squirrel, but what just happened? He just told me that what I said isn't as important as what Courtney said. Now, granted, they're married, and they're supposed to pay attention to each other, but that's irritating, don't you think? But God will never do that. God will never be distracted by somebody else. He's going to listen to you. He's going to listen to what you have to say. But we have to do the same. We have to talk to him. And I'm guaranteeing you this. There's not much I can guarantee in life, but this is one. Is if you talk to God on a daily basis, it's going to change your life. Because then you're not going to worry about all those circumstances that you can't change. What you'll become concerned about is what I can do to grow closer to the Lord. Because that's what conversation, that's what relationship is all about, is this conversation. I, I tell the first service, I grew up in a very conservative church, very conservative. And when they prayed, when the elders prayed, I mean, it was this long, flowery thing, $90 words, a lot of these and thous. I didn't understand a thing they were saying, about the only thing I understood was at the end where he said amen. So when I got older, I went, I went to Lincoln Christian College and had a friend of mine that they'd have a student after every chapel service have the student have the closing prayer. So this is the way he started. Everybody's, their heads are bowed. Everybody's quiet. And he goes, hey God! That's how he started it. No dear, great, wonderful, magnificent, powerful Lord! No, he just said, hey, God. And I thought, wow. Because I looked at the professor sitting in the first row, and they are all older men and, you know, pillars of the, of the faith, and they about fell out of their chair. And I thought, but that's the way it should be. The Bible tells us that we can call God dad. Yes, we need to be respectful. Yes, we need to acknowledge that he is God, but he's also our father. He's also the one who created us in his image and recreated us in his son's image. So we have that relationship that we can go to him at any time of the day. And that leads me to the third resolution. The first resolution is resolve to live by grace. The second one is replace your worry with prayer. And the third thing he says, again in verse 6, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Tell God everything. Don't leave anything out. Do you find yourself doing that when you pray? I've done that before. As if God didn't know what was in my heart. And I'm sitting there going, oh yeah, life's great, wonderful, praise you, thank you very much. And when I'm hurting, when I've sinned, when I've done something to disobey God, and I'm trying to pull the wool over God's head, his eyes, do you think that's going to happen? No! Because God's not listening to your words. He's listening to your heart because that's where it is. That's where the message is coming from. And we need to be honest with God. We may not be able to be honest with our best friend or our spouse, but we need to be honest with God because he knows what's going on anyway. And how do you feel if you had children or whatever and they lied to you? 
My mother, besides being a class A uh, warrior, she was a class double A lie detector. She knew the second the words came out of my mouth that I was lying. She knew it. Couldn't pull anything over on her. I couldn't. I couldn't. God is bigger than that. There's nothing that we can say to lie to God, to make him love us more, to make him bless us more, to make, us save us, make him save us more. He knows what's going on in here. So since he knows what's going on in our heart, we need to be honest with our words. When we pray to him, don't be afraid to take anything to him. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be upset or don't think that he's not going to, he's not going to, he's going to love you less because you talk about your sins. He's the only one that can take them away. He's the only one that can wipe them out. There are people in your life who will hold a grudge against you for the rest of eternity, but God doesn't do it. Resolution number one, resolve to live by grace. Number two, resolve to, re, uh, <clears throat> to replace your worry with prayer. Number three, resolve to tell God everything. And the fourth one is do it with a thankful heart. Do you ever sit and think about your prayers and what you say and all the are complaints? Or I want this and I want that and, you know, and if God doesn't answer, he doesn't love you. Do you ever get to that point? I have. It feels like that God is so far away, but who moved? Me. So I started, because I went back and I, and I did a study on the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught the disciples. Now, I'm not saying that you have to say that word for word. It's not a magical incantation. You don't wave a magic wand, say the words, and boom, you get what you want. No, it's, it's a kind of an outline. Here's the way you should pray. And the way Jesus started was, he praised God for who he was and who he is. He didn't just start out and tell us that start out with your, your Christmas list as if you're sitting on Santa's lap and go down the list and say, this is what I want, this is what I want, this is what I want. He praised God for who he is. Start every prayer that way. I know you've got hurts and dis discouragements and needs and wants, and I know you do that. We, we all do. But you don't have to start with that. I tell first service that when I was little, um, my parents asked us to make a Christmas list. Now, some of you are going to understand this, and some of you won't. I just, we just picked up the Sears catalog and handed it to him. Now, for those of you who are under the age of 30, the Sears catalog is the Amazon of my de de generation because it had everything in it. So when my parents said, what do you want for Christmas? I want everything. But what I really wanted most of all was a fort. I wanted an, a, a cowboy and Indian fort. So what did I get? I got clothes. I got a G.I. Joe. I got a bike. But no fort. I'm 64 years old. I still don't have my fort. But what I got is what I needed. What my parents did for me was what I needed. And I never got too little. There was never too little. It was always too much. And even though I didn't get my fort, I got what I needed. And it was great. And that's what God does for us. With a thankful heart. And I did. You know, I'm terrible at saying thank you sometimes. And I don't, it's not that I don't mean it, but I do. I really say thank you. And when I managed the, brand, the bank branch over here, um, I told my tellers, I said, I don't want you to ever go away, a customer to go away when you said, here you go. Or no problem. When they said thank you. Sometimes we treat God that way. We are so accustomed to getting what we want and being blessed that we start to take the blessings for granted. And we don't remember the fact that we don't deserve those blessings. 
Now, that's not to depress you. Again, it's a reality. But praise be to God that he <laughs> looks past all that. He looks past our greed. He looks past our, our selfishness and our self-centeredness. And he goes right to where it is. I love you. If we go to God with a thankful heart and being thankful for what we have instead of being so worried about what we don't have, your life will change. I've never been in a hurricane. And Danny and Linda, oh, Linda left. Danny, I don't want to worry you, you know. But I understand that hurricanes kind of are either in a curve or a, a circle kind of thing. And at the very middle of that is the eye of the hurricane. And from what I understand, it is completely calm. Completely. You don't realize that there are 200 mile an hour winds blasting everything around it. But here in the middle is the calm. My brothers and sisters, if you pay attention to these things, this is what you're going to get. Resolution number five. He says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When people hear the word peace, they think absence of war. That that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about being in that eye of the hurricane. The storms are raging all around you. The waves are crashing. The wind is blowing. You, you really don't know which way to turn, but in the middle, in the middle, in the eye, is the peace of God. That allows you to adjust to every situation. That allows you to not let circumstances overwhelm you. That takes away the worry about, I can't change my circumstances. But what you can do is change you, change your attitude. I trust God. I know I can't do this by myself. I know, and that's okay. It's all right. But I trust God that no matter what the outcome, I win because I'm a child of God. That is so inspiring to me. It is so powerful because I tell myself a million times, I'm not worth it. I'm not worth it. I, I, I can't. I'm not worth it. And God says, ah, no, no. Forget that. You're my child. I sacrificed my son for you. So how important are you? Five resolutions I want you to keep. I hope you wrote them down. Resolve to live by grace, realizing that God does love you, that he gave up a lot to love us. Replace your worry with prayer. The first thought is, let me take this to God. Let me lay everything, which is number three. Tell God everything. Don't hold anything back. Lay it out there. Number four is to, to do it with a thankful heart. Remember to say thank you. That all that we are given, instead of worrying about what we don't have, be thankful for what you have. And the last one is you get it rewarded with the peace of God. Even in the midst of storms, the peace is there. All we have to do is accept it. The uh, worship team has kind of come out again and lead us in singing. And I just, again, I want, I want to let you know that anything that I said today comes out of a loving heart because I preach it to myself. There's so many times that life can just get you down to the point where you want out. But don't. Because there is somebody that loves you. Even if the world says it hates you. The Lord who created the world loves you. And even though Christmas is done, guess what? We can celebrate Christmas every day of the year. It may come without presents. It may come without Christmas trees. It may come out without tinsels and big family dinners. But Christmas can be celebrated every day. And one of my favorite lines out of the Christmas carol is that the ghost of Christmas present said, we do not celebrate Christmas one day of year. 
but every day of the year, just as we celebrate Jesus every day of the year. Because Paul said, the Lord is near. He's closer than any skin that you have on your bones right now. He's closer than any relationship. He's right next to you. And he cares. And even when we fall, he's there to pick us up. We just have to stretch out our hand. We're going to uh, celebrate the remembrance of what Christ did for us um, by partaking of the emblems. And it's a little different. We left it the way it was Christmas Eve. So instead of going to the side, please, when you're ready, they're going to start singing. When you're ready, come up and, and uh, take part and then go back to your seats. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for putting up with my stuttering and stammering. And I pray that God did speak to your hearts, no matter what I said. Now let's go to Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we humbly bow before you and thank you so much for your presence in our lives, for never going away, never failing or forsaking us, but always being there to listen, to guide, to direct us. All we need to do is to open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts to listen to your message and walk every day, whether they're small steps or giant leaps, closer to you. Father, I thank you for these folks who are here this morning. I pray that you did speak to them, that they'll take something away from what was said and what in the songs, the fellowship, and take it with them and keep it with them each day of the coming year. And that they will share it with others who may be in a similar situation where life doesn't seem worth living. Father, forgive us when we doubt you. Forgive us when we turn away from you and think we can do it on our own. But I praise you that you're always near. And we praise you in the name of the one who makes it all possible, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.